good afternoon everybody um, this audience is definitely the real warrior to survive after lunch <laughs> so <laughs> thank you very much all for being here uh, uh, thank you very much pathfinder foundation uh, ambassador banat gunatilika sir uh, and the whole team of pathfinder for inviting me and this is a real uh, way forward for our partnership i mean i was here two years back and so happy that uh, it has translated into this particular kind of event um i think uh, the chair has uh, very <coughs> nicely brought out the importance of the underwater domain and so i will not go into the basics of why this session is there or why this is important but uh, i just want to kind of highlight that the entire world or the universe is 75% water so underwater has to get the importance that it deserves and all of you will understand that most of the challenges and opportunities exist below the surface of the water and it is very important to explore the underwater acoustic capacity is the key and if you look around you will find acoustics hardly getting any importance or people understand very little about the acoustics so with that premise i would like to move forward and the topic is aptly chosen security and the economic dimension so i'll cover it under these heads now let us look at the 21st century new global order typically i mean it has been discussed i mean it was very very encouraging to listen to the honorable president and his perspective was really very very insightful and i personally learned a lot and you can see the entire global strategic interactions have now shifted to the tropical waters and that aspect has to be really kept in mind when we say talk about the underwater because the technology development particularly in the underwater domain happened in the during the cold war era and at that time the theater of operation was the greenland iceland uk gap because the two superpowers wanted to engage in that particular region so that technology is far different from what is required in the tropical waters to give you some numbers a sonar that was tested there gave 32 nautical miles and the same sonar when it comes to our waters the indian ocean gives you 7 nautical miles so there is 60% degradation of sonar performance so what is underwater domain without a sonar point number 1 point number 2 is the biodiversity is the richest in the tropical waters so the opportunities is huge there is lot more to be gained whether it is for the community or even for the corporates fisheries aquaculture whole lot of things you can talk about even the mineral resources it's massive so with this i would like to take you to the next slide now we talk about indo pacific i mean the honorable president talked about the various de uh, definitions or understanding of the indo pacific but one dimension of the indo pacific is by definition it is the tropical waters of the indian ocean in the pacific ocean and unless you understand the uda for the tropical waters i don't think we have the right way of moving forward so the tropical aspect is extremely important and if you get a deterioration of the sonar performance of the order of 60% i mean typically largely this part of the world has this conventional thinking of importing technology and know how it is not just the technology but we also try and get the deployment strategy also if your sonar is giving you 60% degraded performance then how can you have the same deployment pattern and i am not just talking about the security even there is so much happening in the non military domain also now the strategic perspective we have to balance people economy and nature when i say people i am talking about the coastal and the riverine community many time our definition of development completely ignores the co uh, the communities i mean we get confused develop whose development are we talking about so inclusive governance is something we really need to be worried about and what are the livelihood potential i mean typically you will see all the big projects it's a massive cause of displacement for the local communities and they are completely ignored and then it becomes a security challenge after some time but can we not i will 
I will answer this question. Can we not build something for them? The second is economy. I mean, the chair has really brought out very clearly. I mean, connectivity through water, not just trade, even communities getting connected. And Indian Ocean has been a civilizational legacy where this entire region was so well uh, connected. And of course, we talked about resources and energy security and a whole lot of aspects. And the third is nature. We talk about climate change, but can you really do climate change assessment without having the underwater domain awareness? Sustainable blue economy, I mean, there's a lot of talk, but we really, I mean, even when we talk about the EV, is it really sustainable? I mean, we have to have a holistic understanding. I'm not going into the details of that. And the third most important is acoustic habitat degradation. Sound is the only signal that propagates effectively underwater. Speed of sound in air is 345 meters per second. Speed of sound underwater is 1500 meters per second. Five times better. So if all these activities that we are talking about, all the anthropologic activities that we are talking about, what impact does it have underwater? If we talk about sonars, then the marine mammals, of course, use acoustic vision. They use sound for all the biologically critical functions, whether it is communication, navigation, you name it. Breeding, finding mates, everything, foraging. So they use sonar better. I mean, uh, during my PhD, I actually studied the dolphins to understand how they use sound. And I developed a classification algorithm for naval applications based on how they do things. So acoustic habitat degradation is becoming very, very important thing. The International Maritime Organization rec recognized acoustic habitat degradation. In fact, there's a lot of talk. In fact, we are happy to tell you that our paper was sent by the government of India. And now in MEPC, 80, in MEPC 76 is got included as a uh, information paper. Now in 81, I think it will be talked about. Now, Indian Ocean region, just to quickly go through, I don't need to tell this audience, strategic relevance is already discussed. Geopolitical and geostrategic reality. What I want to highlight here is the fragmentation. The nations in the region are not even talking to each other properly. But what is important here, not just the political volatility, but the demographic bulge. I would use the word bulge. I mean, if we just talk about the BIMSTEC, 25% of humanity resides in this region. And these are young aspirational population. The West is getting old. If these people can be channelized correctly, we can actually drive global agenda from here. And it is rightly so shifting to this area. So the capacity and capability building becomes the key to this. We when we talk about bilateral or multilateral partnerships, we straight away jump into some solutions. Solutions will not come unless, I mean, like we also talked about Sri Lanka's situation, how they handle great power rivalry. Even when we are talking to people, if we don't have understanding, I'm not particularly talking about Sri Lanka, I'm, I'm no expert on Sri Lanka, but I'm, what I'm trying to say is, unless we understand the domain well, we will not be able to pick and choose the right thing that we want. Typically, it is a canned solution that comes from the West and the entire package is given to us. We don't even need 10% of it. There are umpteen examples that we can talk about. But if we know what is the problem and what we want, then we can go out to 10 people, take what they have to offer or what we need. Then it rationalizes. Then we don't become dependent on one. I'll, I'll explain this in some time. Now, this is the price we are paying. I mean, these are live examples. Of <clears throat> the first one is a 42 feet blue whale standing west of India. Second is 50 feet bride whale, again west of India. And then the third is 90 pilotless whales in Totikorin, very close to Sri Lanka. This is the price we are, the big whales are not supposed to be seen north of Sri Lanka. This, I have written a paper that this is the anti-piracy operation that has been going on since 2009. It's a very detailed paper I have written. It is acoustic habitat degradation. So when we talk about development, we have to also understand acoustic habitat degradation. 
2018, there were 80 big whale strandings in the Maharashtra coast alone. There's an Indian state in the west, 80, uh, 720 kilometers of coastline. They had 80 big whale strandings. So this is a very serious issue we need to all understand. Now we talk about maritime domain awareness. I have a problem with maritime domain awareness in the conventional sense because the way it has been defined, I would like to call it an event driven 9-11 globally and 26-11 in, in our part of the world. And as usual, when something happens, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of talk, but no substance. Sorry to be very blunt. Maritime domain awareness has remained a security driven formulation. In the last Tokyo summit of the Quad, they talked about greater public good. Do the security agencies understand what is greater public good? And even what was discussed, I mean, it's not just me, there's a lot of chatter in the, uh, you know, experts community also. What is greater? I mean, they said even data sharing. And that too, through those eight fusion centers that we have globally, all are military driven. Do they even understand what the communities need? Can they serve what is required for the greater public good? I have a paper we can discuss that in some other uh, <coughs> discussion. So there is a problem with the conventional understanding of MDA. Because if you have to include UDA in the conventional MDA, then it has to have acoustic capacity building at its core. And what is MDA, if 90% of everything is happening below the surface of the water, what purpose does MDA serve without UDA? Now, just to quickly talk about the stakeholders, security is just one part of the larger thing. And when we talk about security, we largely discuss, or it is largely driven by the external security agencies, which is largely led by Navy uh, of the various countries. And if you talk about just the Navy, it is just probably one of the three security establishments or the maritime forces, and in that also it is part of the four. So blue economy, environment, and science and technology. Just to quickly elaborate, I mean, when we talk about security, internal security gets completely misunderstood. I mean, armies are not, you know, capable of understanding what is underwater domain. When we talk about transboundary rivers, when we talk about water bodies in the freshwater systems, we completely ignore that part as, as a constituent of the security formulation. And we talked about 2611, Kasab and his friends came by a surface boat. And so in our matrix, we are still hoping that the next guy will also come by a surface boat. What about underwater robotics? The chair mentioned about LTT. LTT, and I have written a paper 15 years back, and a, a terrorist group from Iran, they had underwater capabilities way back 30 years back. And we are still not prepared. Our maritime forces are still not prepared for an underwater attack. So we have to solve tomorrow's problem, not yesterday's problem. And of course, migration by sea. This part of the world is going to see massive, the unequitable distribution of wealth is so much more. This migration is going to become a serious problem. So these are some of the security challenges, non-conventional security challenges we have to be really uh, aware of. And today, underwater robotics is being done by uh, school children. I have been part of a AUB competition in uh, Singapore where college students had come up with very fantastic ideas of underwater drone. So security establishments have to really understand this. Now talking about blue economy, of course, Indian Ocean is the hub for energy security. The second picture that you see, food security. We are increasingly looking at the oceans for food security. But what we forget is the fisheries. When we talk about fisheries, there's a Colorado University report which says that since 1996, the fish stock is on the decline. Fish stock globally is on the decline. But the bycatch is of the, of, of the order of 80%. How do we rationalize this? I mean, on one end, we are going down in terms of the stock and the bycatch is of the order of 80%. How do we reconcile this? Then, of course, deep sea mining. Now, uh, Chair mentioned about International Seabed Authority. 
I mean, this is something, I mean, they, even they are not able to figure out. I mean, the Secretary General was in India and I was also invited for a round table. They are also still figuring out what to do, how to, I mean, they have done, uh, there are countries like even India who have spent massive amount of money for the exploration part, but the exploitation rights have not been given because they are still, and then there are countries like France which have not been part of the earlier initiative. So now they are saying, now you have messed up enough on land, don't go uh, touch the sea. So, <laughs> I mean, there are a whole lot of geopolitical issues that are being discussed. Now, even in the freshwater system, there is a lot to be seen. I mean, so the UDA that we talk about covers the entire marine and the freshwater systems. I'll not go into the details of this. I mean, inland water transport is being talked about so much. People don't understand what is dredging. Now, dredging has become the de facto tool for navigability. What happens to the benthic ecosystem? Now, there are ports, I, I don't want to name, there are very massive ports which have become unviable because of the dredging budget has become far beyond what they can manage. So we have to, and because we are running to the Nordic countries for solutions, do the Nordic countries understand what is tropical waters? Now again, disaster management and again, sustainability. I mean, acoustic habitat degradation has to become one of the mainstream discussions. Otherwise, the way that activities are increasing, we will have serious issues. And science and technology. I mean, how do we get more and more science and technology? I mean, we talk about digital world. But when we say digital ocean, really, how many of us really understand what is digital underwater? I'll not go into the details. I mean, if you talk about Indian Ocean, we have very little understanding of the what are the species that exist. Unless we understand that, we have better domain awareness. We can't even navigate sustainability. And then, you know, if we just talk about India, our EZ is 3.7 million uh, uh, lakh square kilometers. Can we put sensors? I mean, the conventional Western way is we'll put sensor and map the whole area. How many sensors can we put? Is it viable to even think like that? What about modeling and simulation? But that requires a different understanding. So this is the framework. I would request you to pay attention to this slide. This is the UDA framework that we have proposed. What it means is, the horizontal construct is the four stakeholders that we are talking about. Strategic security, which includes both internal and external security. Blue economy with all the components, whether it is fisheries, aquaculture, everything. Third is environment and climate change, or sustainability and climate change. And fourth is digital transformation. Now, all of them together, I mean, it is particularly important for the Indian Ocean region, which is a tropical water. Unless we focus on the acoustic capacity building, we don't go anywhere. If my sonar is giving me 60% degraded performance, what are we doing? We still are importing technologies. We are, forget the technology, even the know-how, how to deploy is also being borrowed from them or learned from them. And you can take up any project if it is successful. So unless we do indigenous effort in terms of acoustic capacity and capability building, we are not going anywhere. And this is where the regional powers have to come together, find an indigenous solution. The second is a uh, vertical construct. We have very little understanding of our conditions. So a lot of sensing the entire framework from the West, whereas our conditions are totally different. Even policy when we get from there or the complete deployment pattern, we can only keep giving waivers and forget what's actually going on on the ground. Now, just to dissect the bigger UDA framework into smaller portions like underwater radiated noise, just to give you an example. Underwater radiated noise is very important for the Navy in terms of, we call it acoustic stealth, right? We don't want to be detected and <coughs> we want to detect quickly. Second is acoustic habitat degradation. The underwater noise in the low frequency because of shipping has been doubling every decade since 1951. The, that is the data that we have from 1951. But experts say from the pre-industrial era, after the industrial revolution. And even if you just look at the data, in spite of all your technological advances, the shipping noise has not reduced because that has never been the priority area. Only, it is only now, 
I mean, even in UNCLOS, they have uh, uh, talked about, uh, sorry, not UNCLOS, UNDP, they have talked, way back in 82, they have talked about hazards of underwater noise. But nothing has happened. IMO in the Kobe Convention in nine, uh, 2002, they first time took it as an agenda item, and now also it is being discussed. Because there is no lobby to push. I mean, if you just compare it with the Ballast Water Treaty, there is no lobby to push this. So it is just going on as a discussion. And even when my our paper was being processed, I mean, we were being seen as enemies of the shipping community. It took me one and a half years to get that paper processed. I mean, of course, government systems have their own time, but I mean, we were seeing being seen as an enemy to that community. I mean, I had to go to individual members to convince them that whatever your concerns are, are being addressed. Other part is sediment management. I mean, I, there are so many examples I can take. I've just taken two of them. Sediment management. The sediment transport pattern in the tropical waters is completely different from the temperate and the polar region. No waterway navigation can happen. Even our coastal navigation cannot happen or even our port management cannot happen unless you understand the sediment transport pattern. So if we understand and get that capability, it will serve everybody. This is what is pooling of resources and synergizing of effort, the entire UDA framework. Now, how do you get it done? User academy, industry partnership, or, you know, if, I mean, I'm just taking an Indian case, but I think this is relevant to any country in the region. There are already schemes, Make in India, Skill India, Startup India, Digital India, and even other countries, multilateral forums, bilateral forums have all of it already built in. You don't need any new schemes to implement UDA. And these are the some of the specific core requirements or expertise that are required. So moment you are able to take care of all of it, the output of this funnel is policy intervention, technology intervention, and capacity and capability building. That's the whole UDA framework all about. And it will serve all these stakeholders that are mentioned. Sediment classification for whether it is water resource management, you can name it. Ho whole lot of uh, stakeholders can be served. And port management, oil and gas, inland water transport, everything is underwater search and recovery. Marine spatial planning. I want to put special mention on this. I mean, the whole digital transformation in the underwater domain. This map, this is what went to IMO, is built out of the AIS data. The entire Indian Ocean region is seen here. The entire region was divided into smaller grids, one lat long. So it's about 12.5 kilometers by 12.5 kilometer grid. We picked up the shipping data from AIS, built the underwater noise generated by each ship, each grid, was taken as one single unit, then the entire tropical channel was mapped or modeled, and then you get the underwater noise because of the shipping in the region. And you can see it, uh, it matches to the realistic thing. But this map can be used, not only that, you know, I'm not here to say that stop shipping, but you can definitely, I mean, this is, you can see post the piracy, the whole shipping lane has shifted and the impact that it has on the acoustic habitat degradation. So I'm not saying you can stop, but with this kind of data, this is real-time data. The AIS data comes every five minutes, so this can produce, I mean, today computational capabilities are uh, quite significant. This gives you a map which is updated every six minutes. With this kind of finer data, I mean, at least, at least during the ecologically sensitive months for certain species, you can divert the shipping or you can have a, I mean, policy makers can take decisions when you have such data available to you. There are naval officers. You can even do your submarine deployment with this kind of data. Any underwater deployment can be done through this. What I'm trying to tell you is you develop the capabilities, so many stakeholders can benefit. And I have a problem when the Navy say, I've been a naval officer myself, that data is sensitive. So let me tell you, so much data is available. If somebody understands the domain, so much is available without you sharing the data. So don't create this bogey of data security. If you do not cooperate, you will not get solutions for yourself also. Now, the UDA framework, policy intervention, we have to get into a proper policy framework, right? I mean, what 
unclosed says and whole lot of things and then it translates to regional forums bilateral relations and then sops for organizations i mean it has to be done with a data driven and with much better understanding the second is technology intervention i think msp would be the most critical technology intervention that is required it will serve everybody i mean we have even built an underwater tool digital tool for shrimp farming for seaweed farming for common carps in the fresh water systems because it's only underwater parameters that are going to make sure the growth of these species so once you understand the whole digital domain you can do so much more translating every parameter into the once it comes on the digital platform today there is enough data analytics capabilities available and of course we have to do field validation for the tropical waters and these are all home grown this is not i mean for us even we don't use a software we write the program we code it ourselves and acoustic capacity and capability building we'll quickly take few examples now we need to dissect when we say uda what does it mean how will you implement it i call it to see to understand and to share what is to see it is the hardware it is a sensor and the platform which will carry the sensor to the desired location now this is to dissect when you want help when you want to collaborate or when you talk about partnership partnership for what it is not the entire package and you know i just need the 10% of it so the sensors platforms whatever i mean it can be a static platform it can be a uh, moving platform to understand is the key it it includes the entire digital analysis right from pre processing post uh, uh, processing and the post processing now this is where we have to have a complete control otherwise we have a strategic compromise if the understand part is completely outsourced you're finished we give away everything that we call of strategic importance and the third is to share how to make it available to the user in real time for actionable input, uh, whether it is a policy maker who needs to take in certain uh, policy decisions or an operational level or even for a common person now to a fisherman you can't give him a display right you have to give him a mobile app today everything is possible and how do we customize that for, i mean we have done this for shrimp farming and seaweed farming as i mentioned he needs specific input whether it is a feeding cycle where his intervention is required and what intervention it should be very specific now this is where i call that this region indian ocean region can i mean even sri lanka has got young population aspirational population and they are very very intelligent and india of course we have built the complete framework now this is where it is important what i showed you there it is not about just deploying sensors to collect data you first model it i mean the picture that i showed you modeling and simulation has to be the basis for msp you model the whole place you do field validation only in specific location then only it is viable otherwise how can developing countries pay that kind of money it is not affordable it is not viable and of course the source path receiver model specific to every application we have to build and when the tropical water is behaving in such a unique manner we have to map that and our application has to be extremely specific so the americans had started talking about the shallow water acoustic measurement swarms exercise now swarms across the world i mean i just want to give you a sense of how the ud has uh, evolved across the world you know the socius was probably the first system just after the second world war 1958 they started this program and you know in its peak there were 30 stations of socius they called it iuss and there were different names but towards the end of the cold war 30 came down to 3 because you know again that was a different era and so i want to remind democracies that the cold war era was different when the americans could even they themselves now get questions i mean the national security gets questioned even for environmental uh, issues so today when our navy say that exclusive systems have to be built for them I, i'm sorry it is not uh, geopolitically viable in america also just after the cold war they got questions for funding they got question for environmental clearances they got even there were naval projects which had to submit environment impact statements that is the reality of the world 
how come this part of the world doesn't understand that you have to have a pooling of resources and synergizing of effort security establishment cannot i mean of course look at the financial uh, sector data is equally critical for them but they are operating in an open system in an open environment and technology provides you that you have to apply your mind so after uh, uh, socius point sur lighthouse was another thing which was driven by uh, naval postgraduate school monterey and this was another absolutely high tech underwater lab where you know field validation was done modeling was done enough research was going on there and that gave a lot of systems to uh, the us uh, military establishment or the naval establishment but after the cold war ended that 10 years period in the last century you know the americans also got a bit of a bit uh, relaxed but towards the end of the last century they realized that the chinese have developed significant capabilities and they can challenge the might of the americans so that's when in this beginning of this century asia x was launched it was a purely academic exercise funded by the office of naval research for data collection and modeling in the south china sea and east china sea and asia x is a very remarkable exercise because the chinese also knew what was going on but they yes sir two minutes more so asia x i will not go into the details of it but this was a remarkable thing and then the, i mean asia x was in the beginning of the century and after 15 years the chinese announced what is called underwater great wall project and asia x was definitely part of the sequence i mean what was announced in the underwater great wall project definitely is a work of at least 20 25 years so there is a very s- direct connection between the two so the chinese have been really investing significantly in terms of their underwater capabilities now geopolitically it has to be a regional approach stakeholder integration i mean i call it this underwater domain awareness framework as a structural comprehensive and inclusive framework and i think this must become an agenda for all bilateral and multilateral platforms that we have anywhere in the world so i mean this is my quick recommendation that geopolitically it has to be on a larger and capacity building must get the priority S- problem solving will be done by the government agencies but the larger collaboration should be on capacity building and greater public good as i mentioned will get i think msp can be a game changer in that and small island nations will definitely benefit significantly if we have coalitions on msp so only way forward is outreach engage sustain i mean this is an outreach where i can sensitize or where more people can sens- get sensitized on uda once the initial sensitization happen engaging at multiple levels multiple internships and fellowships for young people who can take this forward giving them specific problems and then of course sustaining it with certain long term projects whether for t- technology intervention or uh, policy intervention a center of excellence this is a model on which we work research multidisciplinary research startup ideas or incubation center innovation keeps getting talked about each of those blocks that you see in the uda framework can be populated in each one of them and of course skilling i mean many people i mean i can talk about even naval officers do not have the understanding of the local conditions academic centers there has to be in academic institutions i don't see a single institution which has acoustics as a program and strategic center so we run this platform my last slide uh, uda digest if you go just type uda digest you will get there are more than 100 articles which uh, you know gives you a sense of the different dimensions of uda there is a knowledge center there are 100 uh, 150 research notes and we are now started populating the innovation notes and also case studies it is under the harvard university model where you know real world problem solving is given in a proper way and then we have a uda dialog page where there's a lot of we have done a lot of programs uh, all that audio video uh, is available expert talks are there and then this is the last one is the learning center we have made a series of e learning modules 10 of them they have been uploaded in the indian government website but to sensitize all the uh, bureaucrats and diplomats but also it is available to anyone who is interested you can write to us and this is going to be populated by another series of six 
more uh, e-learning modules, each of them having 15 sub-modules. So this is the marine spatial planning platform we have built. This is a complete digital tool. You can actually solve every problem here. I mean, you can just click and you will get a map for that. And the entire thing has not been populated, but this is the comprehensive work that we are working on. I mean, you will get for each of the applications, you can click and get what you want. I mean, this is a real time uh, tool that has been built. I think I will not spend too much time. This is the last slide for your consumption. I think I've explained everything. Thank you very much.